On today's show, we'll be focusing on body image. We'll be talking to three guests who have overcome struggles with body image, find out their story, and also hear their message for young girls and young boys who may be struggling with the same issues that they did. In 2005, I weighed 250 pounds. I realized that my life was sort of going out of control and I had some serious body image issues. One day a client of mine came into the salon and told me about an amazing sport, roller derby, and I knew that that was going to be my answer. So not knowing anything about roller derby, I found out that the tryouts were three weeks away. I didn't even know how to roller skate. Keeping in mind, I was 250 pounds. So I donned my first pair of skates, showed up at the Calgary Roller Derby Association, and started to skate. The great thing about roller derby and what it did for me in my self-image was that there was really a place for me and everybody. All of a sudden, my journey began, and six months later, I'd lost 50 pounds. Feeling better about myself, I decided to go out for the very first time, and lo and behold, at the end of the bar was this cute guy. Mustered up every little bit of courage that I possibly could, because I really, until this point, hadn't dated or anything in about four years. Walked to the end of the bar, asked this guy his name, and now we've been married for two years. So thanks to Roller Derby, thanks to getting my own self-image and my body image back in shape, I now can say that I'm a happy, healthy, 160-pound girl. Thank you, Trina, for joining us in the studio today. Wow, what a story. Well, thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people would be really inspired by your story just by hearing what you went through. So you used to weigh 250 pounds. Yeah, in 2005. Wow. I weighed 250 pounds. So look at you today. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, <laughs> it's been a journey, that's for sure. I guess, wow. you know, we can start out in 2005 at 250 pounds. Uh, I ended up on the Oprah Winfrey show. Correct, and that's actually where I saw you. I think, what year was that when you were on there yeah, with two, your ex? 2005 was wow. the first show. And, um, you know, on her show, she sort of called me out on a few different, you know, insecurity things that I had about myself. and it became evident that my marriage was not going to be a successful one based on how I felt about myself and how my husband felt about me. And so subsequently we got divorced and um, it started me on a journey and a path of self, you know, looking into myself and making, having to make some decisions about me. Was I happy at that weight? Was Absolutely. I the girl that I wanted to be? Was I reaching my potential? And when I really took a sober sense of thought, the answer to many of those questions were no. No, I didn't need to eat every single day to make myself feel better. I know, right? You know, and uh, I took some action. Decided to start playing roller derby, which is an amazing sport. They welcomed me in, 250 pounds, wow. thought I was going to be a phenomenal hitter. So did that help you? Is that what you continue to do to keep off the weight? Is that the secret, really? Do uh, I need to join a roller do derby team then, too? I would <laughs> recommend that anybody that wants to get some good, healthy activity in roller derby is an amazing sport for any body and any buddy. And I think it's a confidence thing, too, right? Oh, my gosh, it's those really women empowering. are amazing. They are amazing. They are amazing. There's wow, not enough think, great things I can say about wow. roller derby in the Calgary Roller Derby Association. I was just wanting to go back to when you were on the Oprah Winfrey mm -hmm. show. I remember seeing you on that and I remember being so upset with your ex-husband because I didn't appreciate how he was treating you on the show. Millions of people, to tell millions of people on the Oprah Winfrey show that you're no longer really that attracted to your wife because she'd put on weight. And I remember there was photos of you when you were thinner before you guys got married. And, but I felt that you were still a beautiful woman. It didn't matter. I didn't think that your size defined your beauty. On that show, I found you very likable, outgoing. You had a great hairstyle too. Yeah. Uh, you're a hairdresser, <laughs> well, right? Yeah, I am. <laughs> Well, thanks. You know, I mean, I was, I was all of those things, and to blame it only on Trevor, I think, is unfair. The bottom line is, is that each one of us is responsible for how we look, Absolutely. and nobody can take our power away. And I think that that was my moment of realization, my eureka moment, where I was the girl that was going to get myself up off of the couch, regardless of how my husband felt about me, and I was going to start my journey on feeling better, so that I could look at myself in the mirror, and so I could be an example to both of my children. And you know, Absolutely. now I've been married to the man of my dreams for yes. two years, who met me, by the way, when I was well over 200 pounds, and uh, loved me at that point, loves me today, and really would care less about how I look and loves me for when I wake up in the morning with bad breath, he doesn't care. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, don't we it's love, true love. Yes, I mean, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Don't we love men that just love us for who we are? What would be your message to young girls or, you know, young guys that might be watching the show today um, who may be struggling with body image issues and even relationships? Because that's another thing, too. You learn through also your marriage that, you know what, 
maybe this isn't working out too. Not only did you lose the weight, but you also changed your way of thinking and started thinking more about yourself and putting yourself first too right. and taking care of yourself. When is enough enough in a relationship too where you find that your partner is no longer supporting you, not only just in regards to body image, but if they're not supporting you confidence-wise as well, what would be your message to people well, I would say this. in a relationship? If you are not willing to say something out loud to somebody, don't say it to yourself. Because I have found that in my life, that I would never speak to somebody the way that I speak to myself sometimes. And I have to catch myself. Yeah. And in the mirror, I say, you know, Trina, that is, not, that is not something you would ever utter in public. Why are you treating yourself that way? And I think that once I started to recognize that negative self-talk, and I was able to change it around. And you know, my husband's really good because he can see me in the mirror and he says, I, know what, I don't know what you're saying, but I know it's not good, so stop it. You know? And it's true. So for young people, I would say that if you're catching yourself standing in the mirror and putting yeah. yourself down, stop focusing on the negative things about your body or about yourself. Start focusing on some of the good things. And Absolutely. Right? And that's what I say to my sister all the time too. Like sometimes we're dressing up and I tell her, well, highlight what you like about yourself. I mean, right. clothing, I think if clothing fits good you can always look good I mean dressing for your size is important and also you know focusing on the areas of your body that you feel confident about is also important too Absolutely. and highlighting it I have good hair so I put a little bit of effort into my hair <laughs> well you do uh, you know I, I've never been a fan of my nose so I try to highlight my eyes I mean I think we could all go on I mean I always say I have cankles so that's not a something you know I'm a basically a pant wear, not a skirt wear. I mean, there's always things that you can well, beat you yourself up about. Well, you look great in your dress today. Well, thank you. <laughs> but you can always beat yourself up about anything. And I, and, and I think that that would truly be my message to people that have any sort of problem in their life, especially with their body. You know, stop comparing yourself to every single girl Absolutely. in the magazine. Yes. I, I, I mean, if anything, we can go back to Oprah for a moment. She is a woman who's been every size, who's had a lot of different struggles in her life, yes. and has succeeded despite it. Don't make your failures your way out of the world. Absolutely. You know, don't, don't use it as an excuse not to participate. And that's really what changed my life was in 2005, I decided to start participating in my own life. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm um, going back to when you said uh, magazines yes. and comparing ourselves you know, to images that we see in magazines. That's something I struggled with, mm -hmm. too. Um, when I was a teenager, I would always look at magazines, Seventeen magazines or Cosmo, and right. always think of, they, these girls look so perfect, and they look nothing like me. Mm -hmm. You know, they are not my skin tone. They, you know, they don't have the same skin color as me. They don't have the same features as me. We don't have the same hair length as well. And I felt like that played a lot on my self-esteem as well, because I always felt like I can't look like this girl, or right. even if they're the same color as me. Still, I don't look like them. Right. And I had to accept myself for who I was, and at the same time, understand that it's not, you know, not realistic for me to look like that yeah. and that standard of beauty is is not the standard of beauty all over the world right so it's all in the eyes of the beholder so Absolutely. I think that's an important point that you just mentioned there stop comparing ourselves mm -hmm. to girls that we see in magazines and at the same time not beat ourselves up all the time Absolutely. right so I think that's really vital so tell us about your projects that you're doing now well um, we have a little internet company called hairflares.com nice. we sell uh, hair accessories to women all over the world uh, again, going back to Oprah, a little gift from her in um, 2010. Tw oh, I'm sorry, 2011. Yeah. And I was on her. You were on the show, yeah, right? Yeah, on the finale. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, she actually uh, asked me what was in my hair, and thanks to her, I can say that I've comfortably been able to put my kids through university because of that. It really. Wow. You and know, you said your business is also because of Oprah. Your business has grown. Well, did you say 2,000 percent? Oh yeah. We we wow. started out with just two girls, myself and my girlfriend. Um, you know, basically in our kitchens. And at our height of our business, we had over 25 employees. And so wow. well, we've really been enjoying some, some very blessed success. Well, Trina, you deserve all the success. Thank you. you really do. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for being here with us. Oh, we pleasure. greatly appreciate Anytime. your time. I just want to give a message to young, old, anybody that um, stop trying to shed the pounds. Just shed the negativity. Shed all the bad views, all the bad words, like any of that negative stuff that ever you know, came to you. Basically just, you know, embrace you. When you look in the, in the mirror, surround yourself with positivity. Look at yourself with positivity. Embrace your curves or, you know, whether you have that straight body that everybody calls this boy body or this big voluptuous body, you know, embrace it all. Just love you and, and when you accept you, that's going to be enough because you won't care what anybody else thinks. And yeah.
Just uh, love yourself. Stop trying to shed the pounds, shed the negativity. <laughs> Brittany, thank you for joining us in the studio today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. What a story. Yes. <laughs> so where did it all start? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, basically, I started modeling when I was about seven years old, and uh, I was approached by a scouter wow. uh, when I was sitting in a restaurant with my mom and just got into it from there. Just did a lot of local fashion shows, mom and tot shows and things like that. Here and in Calgary? Yeah, just oh, wow. locally. So uh, I met a lot of amazing people in the industry, even just for being so young. And, um, and it made me overcome being nervous and, and you know, being shy around people. So it was a good way to get out there. So how old were you when you started modeling? I was seven. You were seven? Yeah, I was seven years so old. So tell us a little bit about junior high. Because okay. you said when you entered junior high, your body started to change and you had some issues with body image. I, so can you elaborate a little bit on that for us? Yeah. So, you know, like everybody, I hit puberty. Yeah. Um, there were some lumps <laughs> and bumps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were some lumps and bumps that, you know, weren't there before. Let me tell you, I was just straight body and tiny and... I didn't know how to deal with it. I got into junior high and I mean kids can be really cruel. They can be really cruel and oh, wow. if you have these lumps and bumps that they didn't have, I mean, they're going to call you out on it. Trust me, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do. I really do. Yeah. And how did you handle that? The I'm, name calling. You were saying that they used to call you... They used to call me Fat Blair. Oh. Uh, I, had a, I had a bully and you know the worst part now that I can look back on it and think about it and say like she didn't even know me. You know, they didn't really take the time to know me. They wow. just they just judged me on, on how I looked on the outside. But uh, it, it, I took it really hard, actually. When I was in junior high, a little depressed. I uh, handled it with eating food, and yeah. and, uh, and which I got bigger, and then I didn't know how to handle that. And it was a, it was a hard time. It was a really hard time in junior high. So do you, did you ever, being bullied, I mean, I think that's so great that you just mentioned that. Being bullied when you're in junior high, did you ever talk to the bully? What did you do to stop the bullying? Did you, know, you ever? I, I did. I, I went up to her and I've always been taught, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah. Um, so I went up to her and I'm like, you know, we don't have any problems. Like, I, I don't know what's going on with you. Yeah, you don't know me. You I don't, don't know, know you. Me. Exactly. So. Like, let's just, let's just call it square and I forgive you and I hope you forgive me for whatever I've done really? to you. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's how I've been raised. Well, that's really nice of you, especially to go up to someone and say, well, you know what? I don't know you. You don't know me. Absolutely. But forgive me if I've done anything wrong yeah, to you. Yeah, absolutely. Because wow. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I did something wrong. And that's what I was thinking when I was younger. Absolutely. So, so. do you think that, um, you know, perhaps someone watching the show today, teenagers that are getting bullied at school, um, do you think it's important for them to talk to an adult about it, ignore the situation or actually approach the bully and talk to them about, you know, what they're doing? Um, I think it would be good to let an adult know, absolutely, because I mean, they can give you that support and that wisdom that when you're younger, you think it is the end of the world, like, this girl's bullying me, like, this is going to follow me for life, and it's, I know, it's, right? it feels like the end of the world. <laughs> I know, it does. It does. I, I got bullied, too, when I first came to Canada, I know, I right? know, and my English wasn't that great, and I was always called stupid all the time, oh. and I was like, oh, geez, I just don't know the language, oh. it's not that I'm dumb, right, but um, I totally understand what you're saying, and I think the best approach, for sure, is to tell an adult, mm -hmm. or, you know, also talk to the individual, and let them Absolutely. know, look, I have no issues, you know. Let's just get it over with. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about what you do now. I uh, am a plus size model now. Correct, wow. And uh, yeah, I got into that when I was about 18, 19. And uh, thanks to mom. <laughs> oh, your mom's always there, right? <laughs> yes, so mom knew. is number one fan. Mom is number one fan. So she like the kind of mom that like takes you like every like casting and stuff? Because you said you started out modeling when you were seven years old. So. Yeah, when I was younger, <laughs> mom was up at like five in the morning, curling my hair, oh, like wow. doing it all, lotioning the skin. So we don't want to <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Well, your, your skin looks fabulous, by Thank the way. You. I should mention Thank that. You. Fabulous Thank legs. <laughs> so, you're modeling now. What agency are you with? I, I understand you are a... Ford Plus model. I love that. Congratulations <laughs> on that, so Brittany. Much. Thank so, you so much. So, I think in your work as a plus size model, are you out there, you know, embracing positive body oh. image and size acceptance? Because I know, like, the plus size industry is really taking off. Can it you has. tell us a little bit about that? It has. I mean, um, when I first got into to the plus size industry, it was a little slow going and things like that. But I mean, it's just 
it's picked up so much within the past few years. I mean, with singers like Adele and, yeah. you know, just all these people embracing their curves and being plus size, it's become so, you know, mainstream now. Yeah. Everyone is so much more aware. Yeah. So much more aware. So it's amazing. There's a lot of more clothes. And recently, um, you're actually one of the models for, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. 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 Congratulations. So we'll Thank be seeing you. Brittany in like a lot of, uh, Catalogs as Hopefully. well. Using catalogs, we'll yes. see you online. We'll also see you in malls yes. across the country. Yes. I hope. Hopefully, yes. come on, you'll yes. be there. I know you will. <laughs> Brittany, thank you so much for sharing your story thank with us. You We're so, so much. grateful to have you here, thank and I know you. that your story is going to impact and inspire a lot of young people watching today. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. I used to think that I was curious because my people were struggling back where I was from. And my people were not in the media. Um, they were not doctors, they were not lawyers. They were not portrayed image-wise. So I thought being a dark-skinned black woman that I was born to suffer or to be a slave. So for the longest time, I didn't like the color I was. And if I, was, if I, if I could be reborn and be a different skin tone, that's what I wish for myself when I was a younger girl. So I grew up really having deep insecurities with my skin tone. Yeah, boy, thank you for joining us in the studio today. How are you? I'm really good, and you? <laughs> well, I'm good. You seem excited to be here. Yeah, I am. I love your excitement. You look fabulous, by the way. Thank you. You too. <laughs> what a great video, by the way. So tell us a little bit more about your story. Um, my story is about um, overcoming my skin tone. Like I used to, I have a problem with being a darker skinned female when I was really young. So I had to, I was, I limited myself because I thought because of the color of my skin, I couldn't do much. So I had to learn that. Everything is not based on skin tones. Yeah, there's more to life than. So where did that all start? Did you grow up in it's, Canada? Did you grow up? Was I was born home? in Ethiopia in a, in a refugee camp. So what happened is when I moved here, and I was eight. When I would look at the refugee camps and the the stories or the pictures or the videos, it was always darker skinned people in those refugee camps. I have never seen a refugee camp with Caucasians. So I always thought, okay, well, it's always my people are we cursed? What's wrong with us? So I I never thought that we were meant to to become something in this life because all the refugee people are always Sudanese. <laughs> so okay, well that's really interesting. So you, you stayed in a refugee camp in Ethiopia? Yeah. And, but in Ethiopia there's black people there. So tell us a little bit, just for viewers that may not understand the whole okay. color complex, okay. can you probably identify, can you kind of give us a little okay. bit more? Um, I mean, I'm a dark skinned girl too, yeah. so I know what you're talking about, we're, but just to give more My detail. people were nilotic, meaning that we're not mixed, we're purely African and we're taller, more slender, and more Negroid features. If you go to Ethiopia... Negroid features, yeah, okay. No, no, continue, continue. If you go to Ethiopia, um, they're a lot shorter, a lot lighter, more curly hair, so because of their ancestors and the mixing with the, the Middle Eastern, so they, they have, have more European features. features. It's a different culture, and so what happened when we were refugee camp in Ethiopia, we were not counted as Ethiopians. We were counted as refugees. We, when, when, a, when a child was born, when I was born in Ethiopia, I didn't have a birth certificate. If I go to Ethiopia, I cannot claim Ethiopian citizenship because I'm not Ethiopian by blood. But I was born in the land, so that means I was not born the correct day. I don't, I don't have a correct birthday. Um, the location I'm from is not. You can't Google it. It doesn't exist. Oh wow. Um, is it's like an unknown zone. It's a zone that no one really goes into. So it's, it's a refugee camp. So anyone born in Ethiopia in that refugee camp, you're not you're not legal in the country. You can't get a job. You're basically non-existing. So how did that feel for you? Because you were born in Ethiopia. I was. Yeah. And I was born there. You yeah. refer to yourself as a refugee. Mm-hmm. So you're like, you're born there, but you still feel like a refugee in that country am, because you can't I am have a status. There. I am a, yeah, Maybe. you have no status. I am a refugee because, you know, I wasn't born in my homeland. I was not born where my ancestors or relatives lived. I was born in a, in a place where I was basically left to die. Like, no one cared if I disappeared tomorrow. No one cared if I had water or... We didn't have the basic needs, so we... We, we, we struggle a lot in yeah, Ethiopia. Yeah, I understand. And I understand. the Ethiopian government didn't care about us. I mean, at the time we were there, they were, they were like exterminating us, like we were like bucks or something. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't it like... It was difficult. You didn't feel human. You just felt like, okay, well, I'm waiting to die. You know, when my time going to come? So it was a very desperate state you, people were in. So it wasn't a good place to live. Wow. I could totally understand what you're saying because I'm a refugee myself too. So mm -hmm. I understand 
you know what you're talking about and I think a lot of people watching could you know relate to that if they've been in the same circumstances <laughs> and yeah. as an immigrant or a refugee mm -hmm. um, that's come to Canada so tell us about when you came to Canada and your perception on you know your skin color did that change at all or do you still feel like an outsider well, when I came to Canada, see, when you're in Ethiopia with, in the refugee camp, you have many other refugees just like yourself. So you know the problem is there, but it's not like it doesn't impact you as much. Yeah. But once I came into Canadian soil, I, I, I was eight, and it was like, I, before I could even speak about myself and my story, I was told, you are a refugee, you are ugly, you are a dark-skinned girl, you are very scrawny, you're very Here tall. Here in Canada? Here in Canada. I felt with ra I've, I've been dealing for, with racism since I was eight, since I came since I said since I came here. So basically, it was the Canadian society basically made me aware of my situation where I was coming from. So it was it wasn't that easy to deal with, but they made me aware. So how did you deal with discrimination and racism when you came to Canada? I had to study my history. I had to study the history of everything. That's the only so way. So it's good to study history, yeah. by the way. <laughs> that's the only way. That's the only way I got over my uh, skin color issues, um, my height issues, everything that I'm dealing with personally, like my insecurities. I had to study my history, the history of my people, the European history, the Latin history, the, the natives. I had to study everybody's history to understand where all these originated from. You're such an amazing <laughs> young girl. You're only 19 years yeah, old, is that correct? Yeah. And you had to study your history, you had to do all this research. I like that. I really yeah. like that. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, your book that you're planning to work on? It's um, sharing your story. It's a memoir, I yeah, understand. It's a, yeah, I, I was going to call it Teen Years. Um, uh -huh. It's going to talk about my life, about um, since, since I was born until now, and how people have this stereotypes and stigma attached to refugees and oh, yeah. you know when I'm walking down the street you won't even know I'm a refugee you think oh she's probably born here or she's stuck up or whatever you're thinking right but they don't understand that I went through a lot as a kid from where I was born and how I lived here so it's a book about um, I guess overcoming insecurities and uh, loving yourself and loving who you are as a person because I have a lot of insecurities I'm still dealing with them till this day they're not gone yet but you know what what I like about you is you've been able to turn your challenges into success because not only are you an inspirational young woman in your community and here in Calgary that's why we you know we have you on the show because <laughs> your story really appealed to us yeah. yeah boy and you know and I congratulate you on all your success and I wish you all the best in the book that you're doing you're doing as well in Calgary, we have over 14,000 South Sudanese um, people mm -hmm. living here in Calgary, and they're the largest group of Africans. Can you tell me a little bit of maybe your work in the South Sudanese community? Okay, um, so what I did is I started two pages on Facebook. One is called South Sudanese Entertainment, which promotes uh, local artists and international uh -huh. artists. It promotes tribal music and non-tribal music. I saw that. Music. I like it, by yeah. the way. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I then like I have it. another one called South Sudanese Beauties, and what I do is I promote tribal beauty, so different Sudanese tribes to kind of get rid of that, because um, within the community we have stereotypes with each other's tribes on, yes, on tribalism, beauty. Yeah. So basically with the, with the page is we're breaking tribalism through beauty by showcasing all the tribal beauty within the community. Correct. And then um, I'm sure you know Paul Galoak, he has a newer study center that, yes, that he does at the church. Yeah. Sometimes I go there when I have time to help them with, with the kids. So what we do is we teach them their culture, their language, where they come from, and the alphabet of their uh, native tongue. So they know who they are. So when they, as they get older, so we're teaching them also how to combat about identity, culture, identity, and heritage. how to combat uh, racism and insecurities at yeah. a very young age. So when they get older, they'll know, you know, this is where I come from, this is who I am, and no one else is going to let me down, or you know what I mean. So. And you help out with the school as well yeah That's I really uh, yeah I help out with the school you know so it was it was good for me too because I'm relearning stuff you know? yeah because I self taught myself how to learn my language so and he's an actual teacher so it was kind of an awesome experience to, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah, boy, we wish you all the best. And I know you're going to do fabulous things in mm -hmm. your career. Really, you have a great smile. You have great energy. Yeah. And um, I can't wait to see what you do. Please stay in touch with us, all right? Thank you for having me on the show. Well, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching our show. And we also want to thank our guests for sharing their stories with us as well. Please follow us on Twitter. And be sure to also check out our website, sundayomani.com. Thank you.